Thank you, thank you very much. I felt uh, less frightened when I listened to the typewriter orchestra. So I'm happy that we still have typewriters in the world. And uh, less frightened to just have a presentation uh, without PowerPoints, just the human voice. And I want to thank uh, you, Ms. Boston, Kathy, Mayor Menino, and all of you in the audience uh, for this amazing event. So I've been thinking a lot, and I thank Kathy's guidance about how poetry is both one of the most ancient arts and at the same time a revolutionary idea for the 21st century. So just, you know how they say when you fly, just relax. They don't say close your eyes, but they say enjoy the flight. Well, let's think together about poetry, art, and social justice. I am here at this amazing gathering without a PowerPoint or an iPod or a Blackberry or why not a strawberry. I am here with the most powerful of instruments, the human voice, and I'm here to speak about poetry, not only as a vocation, but as a way of life. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, the knowledge of the existence of something unfathomable to us the manifestation of the most profound reason coupled with the most brilliant beauty, and you will never guess who wrote this. These are the words of not a poet, but of a scientist, Albert Einstein, who also understood life's mysteries as well as the awareness and the glimpses into the marvelous through intuition, poetry, and the beauty of mathematics. Poetic language allows us to glimpse into the marvelous, as well as the possibility to create a world beyond the ordinary, a world more humane and more sublime. Poetry has the capacity to heal, to transform, to alleviate human suffering, all of a sudden comes a sound, a word that shatters what we understood before. And we begin the process of unlearning the older recipes to understand reality as new. Poetry can allow us to imagine the sound of trees as an orchestra of oboes, or the rain as a way of understanding that the world is crying. I came into poetry because I grew up in a country of poets, very, very far away at the end of the world, a country that all, everybody knows, either for a dictator or for these miners. Everyone was a poet, from the plumber, to the gardener, to the teacher, to the doctor. And for those who did not know how to read, they knew how to sing and memorize the lyrics of what was being sung in front of thousands. I came from a country when a poet ran for president. That would never happen in the US, but it may be a better idea. Um, <laughs> And travelers almost 4,000, this poet travels almost 4,000 kilometers, the whole length of Chile, to decide that he was better off writing poetry. This was Pablo Neruda, and led his friend Salvador Allende to run for the presidency, and he became a president. This was the time of the 70s, a time similar to what we see today in Tariq Square 
why not Wall Street? But the revolution did not start with Facebook, but with words that transform the fabric of our lives. Now how I was transformed by poetry. As a young girl, my favorite pastime was to walk only a mile from the village of El Quisco to Isla Negra, which is not an island nor black, but just the next town. And what I wanted to find the most was the most revered of poets, Pablo Neruda. He used to always sit by the rockery coast near his house with a big poncho and a borsalino hat and many, many green pens and frail bits of paper. I wanted to greet him and watch him write, but more than the destination was the journey itself, where my mother, a Chilean Scheherazade, used to tell me all sorts of stories about, for example, my father's favorite friends, Pedro the Skeleton, and my father was a physician who loved his skeleton and about her wedding dresses being almost caught on fire the day of the wedding and the benevolence of rain that helped her save the dress. But one particular thing stands on my mind and this is what I want to share with you today. She said, put your hands in your pocket, see what you find, perhaps, you will find the universe. And I did, I found agates, maps that did not work, a compass, a small pen, and many magical stones. The lesson my mother taught me has to do with something very profound, imagination and creativity the possibility of imagining a universe in a child's pocket and the possibility that one can invent and create a world. Really, one is what one imagines to be, and maybe now I imagine to be very tall standing at this podium. <laughs> Poetry and art has the capacity to transform lives, demand engagement, never passive participation. We live in a most incomprehensible world, often shattered by fanaticism. We witness the pervasive domination of authoritarian governments and the struggle for civil societies. Art allows us to enter the incomprehensible, the unnameable, the unspeakable, and to look at the images of Fernando Botero on Abu Ghraib and to understand torture. Art is to inspire, to become renewed, to reveal. No wonder most totalitarian societies imprison their artists, Garcia Lorca, murdered by the fascist forces in Spain, Primo Levi unable to write anymore after the Holocaust and taking his own life. And also us by cutting funds to programs related to music and art. And what would be of us in a world devoid of music, of passion, of words? You may wonder what is poetry now and what does poetry does in our world. So here comes another important idea about poetry. The experience of reading poetry is an experience of reciprocity between the poet and the reader. It's an encounter with two people perhaps physically removed from one another, but nevertheless together. 
Thus, reading poetry allows you to connect deeply with yourself and the other only encounter through a text. The reading of poetry allows you to understand the unspeakable, often to defy death. Poetry has the ability to console and to mesmerize. Poetry allows you to slow down, to name the world, and hopefully it could become a nocturnal encounter with yourself after the noise of the mundane, poetry will offer rest, respite, refuge. It will spellbind you, and it will offer you access to the life of others, to the imagination of others, with empathy. That is another way to speak about compassion. Just like my mother gave me the tools to open the gate to the imagination, it also gave me the tool to become engaged with the world of activism and social justice. I learned through the readings of Neruda, Milos, Vallejo, Mistral, that poetry allows to share a communal experience, especially by those who live with war and violence. When the ostracized Russian poet Anna Akhmatova wrote her most poignant poem, Requiem, about the incarceration of her son, she tells the following. I spent 17 years waiting in line outside the prison in Leningrad. One day, somebody in the crew, in the crowd, identified me. And she asked in a whisper, everyone whispered here, can you describe this? And I said, I can. In Latin America, poetry has described the unspeakable spaces of torture, where the voices of the victims and the torturers are heard in the palace of horror, and also it has allowed generations of people to name the vanished, the missing. It has allowed us to look at what's invisible and make it visible to the human heart. And I remember the voice of Pablo Neruda clandestinely crossing the Andes mountain and finding refuge in the love of a stranger who also knew his poetry or the poetry and music of Victor Jara, who in prison and blindfolded sang at the National Stadium in Santiago, Chile, where thousands were detained. And in spite of the military cutting of his hands, they could not silence his voice. Nothing is more precious or sublime than the human voice and to imagine, as my mother once told me, is to be in touch with the sacred. Many poets in Latin America have kept alive the broken dreams of a people, of an entire generation of the missing, and today we are here to speak about them and to praise their poetry, who had abandoned love and rage. Only through the mutual exchange of gifts between poet and reader, art finds consolation and refuge for the vulnerable, for the marginalized, as the language of art seeks to enter our interior world, it alleviates human suffering. I proposed a toast to poetry, to its universal community of readers. And let us begin this fall evening with a poem, Imagine the Wind Dancing Through the Leaves and the Leaves Finding a Similarity to the Shape of Our Hearts. 
And if we reach to our pockets, we can find the universe in our hands, the universe that holds words. And to end, what is to speak about poetry without reading you? I will read you two very brief poems. And I just happened to see a dear friend of mine in the audience, Juan Mandelbaum, an Argentinian filmmaker who has devoted his life to telling the story of the disappeared. And this is to Juan. And um, this poem is written in the memory of Renee Applebaum, a mother of the disappeared who uh, lost three of her children to the military dictatorship. So I'll read you this poem, a brief one, and then another one. When she showed me her photograph, she said, this is my daughter. She still hasn't come home. She hasn't come home in 10 years. But this is her photograph. Isn't it true that she's very pretty? She's a philosophy student. And here she is when she was 14 years old and had her first communion, starched, sacred. This is my daughter. She is so pretty. I talk to her every day. And she no longer comes home late. And this is why I reproach her much less. But I love her so much. This is my daughter. Every night I say goodbye to her and I kiss her and it's hard for me not to cry, even though I know she will not come home late. Because as you know, she has not come home for years. I love this photo very much. I look at it every day and it seems that only yesterday she was a little feather angel in my arms. And here she looks like a young lady a philosophy student, another disappeared. But isn't it true that she's so pretty, that she has an angel's face, that it seems as if she were alive? And to end, uh, a humorous poem, because I think we need more laughter, not to think so much about our fantasy portfolio, and not to think so much about diets. I think that's a big problem. <laughs> and uh, my grandmother, when she came to America many times to visit us, she thought that it was very frightening to come to U the US. She thought that here only gangsters lived. And maybe she wasn't so wrong, after all. <laughs> and also, she was very upset that people ate so early, like at 6 PM. And she said that she didn't want to eat with the chickens. She wanted to eat late. So I thought about my grandmother, and I wrote this poem that is called, I Don't Do Lunch. If you are identified in some parts of the poems, don't be offended. It's only a joke. <laughs> I don't do lunch. I don't usually seek the company of others for lunch. I just don't do lunch. <clears throat> It is painful to interrupt the day at noon, brush your teeth at noon, not allow any human smell to escape. It is annoying to meet with bureaucrats, maker of precocious deals, talk about the stock market, or listen to an owner of stars, or a proprietor of a stretch of sea. Power seduces, but it's vain. can compare with poetry or with books where dreams are recorded. Don't invite me for lunch. That's for Protestants. <laughs> it's too sensible. That's something for wealthy ladies. What is that of a salad and half of a sandwich? Or soup and half of a sandwich? I want life in all its fullness. Though I am not from the Mediterranean, I would love to be, invite me over for dinner, when the evening light is a woman in her voluptuous nakedness, smelling of garlic and olives, 
and ochre is the color of love. Robust angels come to our table, pasta is a friendly crown. Nobody eats grass or salads with names like Jennifer or Karen. Life is so delightful after six. We let our hair loose, take off our shoes. We imagine ourselves dancing on the tables. Wine is transformed into golden sediment. Words adapt the confusion. Everything flows and escapes. Only the present remains. And though we are in a village, we imagine being in Rome at the Piazza del Popolo, like the pagans, authentic in their faith. I don't do lunch. Don't give me salad with endives or low calorie dressing. I only accept invitations for dinner when light is generous and night is like a woman in love. Thank you.